thank the society for having me. This is something I love to talk about. Um, I really, you know, I love taking questions throughout all this. I want to make sure nobody misses anything in what I have to say. Um, but this is more or less going to be about predation by fungi. So not things predating on fungi, but things actually being eaten by mushrooms. Um, and now there is actually a trivia question. Um, I would like to see if anybody can pick it out from the talk. Uh, which Hohenbohelia species is the basal ancestor of both Pleurotus and Hohenbohelia. And I'll mention it in the talk. So if you can spot that factoid, you'll, you'll get the prize. Um, well, I guess I'll go ahead and get started. Um, first off, I, I would like to mention one of the common things I'm gonna be talking about through this whole talk, um, and that's gonna be nematodes, um, probably the most common and unfortunate prey of fungi. Um, they're small worm-like micro animals, sometimes macro animals. They basically occupy every ecosystem, every niche on earth. They're pretty much forming a small film coating all surfaces, your skin, the soil, leaves and trees inside of plants and trees. They're extremely diverse, extremely well adapted to a number of environments. And for the most part, relatively small, sort of clear worm-like things. Um, there's some that get multiple feet long, but you'll find in intestines, but those aren't exactly relevant to predation in this context. Um, and then of course, most of what we're going to be talking about is what mycelium is doing, that vegetative body of the mushroom, which that mushroom is really just a short-lived temporary part. It's the mycelium in this case, it's going to be doing all the eating, creating these complex traps in order to capture prey or sometimes even weapons. Um, and with that out of the way, I guess I wanted to really go over one of the problems that sort of plagued research in predatory fungi and just concepts of it in general. You know, when we're talking about ecological roles of fungi, there's really the big three, you know, there's mycorrhizal, saprobic, and parasitic. You know, mycorrhizal fungi are those that associate with trees uh, and their root systems. Saprobic fungi are those that eat dead wood, litter, leaves, really any dead decomposing material of pretty much anything that contains carbon. Uh, and then parasites, a much more wiggly class, but in general, things that attack living organisms, often in the case of mushrooms, trees, or plants. Um, what nobody really talks about is sort of a fourth ecological role, and that's predation actual predatory habits to capture prey. Now, when we think of predation in animals, it has a really clear cut definition. You know, you're thinking of something like a hawk or a shark or a snake, which actually moves, wanders through its ecosystem with specially adapted anatomy to also seek out moving prey. There's a lot of movement involved. There's really, really well adapted anatomy to make these things happen. And in a lot of cases, they're obligate carnivores. Um, when you remove the movement from one of the two parties, it gets a lot more dicey. When you're talking about things like a filter feeding whale shark, for example, despite the fact that what it's eating on a mass scale are small planktonic animals, we usually don't use the word predator for species like that. We'll say filter feeder or grazer um, et cetera, even though it's animals being ingested. Now, when you remove the movement from the predator, it gets even more dicey. Um, with a few exceptions, terrestrial fungi generally don't move. They're totally emotile. Some of them have tiny swimming spore stages, but they're not eating at that life stage. Um, and so they have to do all of this work to capture prey without any movement. Um, this mostly manifests as immovable weapons or traps. Um, there's a lot of these lifestyles that are so specialized, it really blurs the line between like 
well, if something is so well adapted to killing nematodes that it almost never even leaves their bodies, is that an infection? Is that a parasite? Is it a predator? Um, and so I'm gonna go over some of the common strategies that species have used, um, kind of where they fall in that gray area and just show some great photos of everything here. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, can you see that all right? Sweet. Yep. Um, so these in the back, these are actually little nematodes uh, on a microscopic scale, these small wiggling worms. Now, this is probably the least debated example of predation in fungi. Um, one of the most well evolved and pretty much discreetly nematode killing mechanisms out there. Um, Arthrobotrys will form what people like to call lassos or nooses or snares. Um, these are more or less a loop with three cells on each side. And when a nematode pokes its head through, um, usually baited there by sex pheromones or food, like uh, eating pheromones that are actually produced by the fungus to bait them in, a combo of chemical and mechanical stimulation will cause those cells to basically inflate rapidly like a collar. Um, this is an example here of a nematode that unfortunately got both ends trapped. Um, the new strategy goes back an extremely long time. Uh, this is actually a fossil in amber from a hundred million years ago. Um, this is an example of a more primitive non-constricting noose. Um, so these do not have the inflatable cells and uh, they'll work in an even more interesting way. Now the snare forming, like the active snare arthrobotrys, um, typically catch only nematodes that are small enough that the mycelium itself can like structurally restrain them. Um, anything larger than the size of their traps is something they likely couldn't hold down. What these do is they actually will produce these large loops, much bigger uh, than the snares of Arthrobotrys. Um, they have a brittle attachment point. So a nematode will slip its head through and actually break it off almost like a collar. The nematode will then wear this collar off into the distance and uh, this is true for both the active and passive snares. Um, after a certain time period, a little peg will start coming from the inside of the collar and punch through the skin of the nematode. And once it gains access to the insides, it starts pumping out digestive enzymes, multiplying rapidly, and it eats it from the inside out. Now, for these passive news forming species, that nematode will have very conveniently wandered off from the main colony. So after it's consumed, it will form a new mycelium from the nematode that's been eaten and produce even more snares off of it to repeat the cycle. It's getting a meal and free transport out of these nematodes. Um, and these are probably some of the most well-studied strategies is these nooses and snares. Uh, they were what was originally described actually by a mycologist named Zopf back in the late 1800s. When he found these, it sort of spawned this very large community of mycologists looking into predatory fungi. They wanted to find more mechanisms. Um, and so I'll go over some of what they've found and then we'll dive a bit back into the history of how predatory fungi actually shaped one of our biggest families of basidiomycetes. Um, so this is actually just a good example of the three cell construction of one of those arthrobotrys nooses and how the cells inflate to capture a nematode that pokes its head through. Um, sometimes that inflation is actually powerful enough to almost snap them in half. Other species have sort of taken the passive noose thing and multiplied it. Instead of forming one single ring, they'll have these nets, more or less many, many fused rings. Sometimes they're poisonous, Sometimes they're sticky, um, but mostly they're convoluted. So you can see over here in the bottom left is actually a nematode that has gotten itself thoroughly tangled. 
Um, and after capture here, uh, Haifei will punch in from all sides and eat it extremely quickly. Um, on the right, you actually have a wonderful example of spores of one of these species where they'll germinate and before they even try to form a mycelia, they will put out a loop. That's the first thing they'll do is put out a loop because that nematode may be their only food source in a food restricted environment. Some of these species are actually able to survive purely off of nematodes as their sole food source if they're, if they're present. Um, and then this is actually one that a lot of you know, this is on the mycelium of Pleurotus, so an oyster mushroom. Uh, they only produce these under certain conditions, um, but these are remarkable little contraptions. These are called toxocysts. They more or less have a little peg coming off of their hyphae with a very, very thin walled, fragile, almost sort of balloon structure. And it is loaded with nematode developed, like nematode specific neurotoxins and paralytic agents. When a nematode encounters one of these, it'll bust open the toxocyst, it'll wick onto the body of the nematode and paralyze it or kill it on the spot until the mycelium has enough time to creep in and more or less eat it alive. Um, down on the bottom, it's not the best imagery, but it's more or less a nematode contacting one of these tiny little toxocysts. And you can see at the end of the whole sequence, the droplet has gone. It's touched the nematode and that's enough to be a fatal dose, even though the size discrepancy is so huge in this case. These are extremely potent neurotoxins. Now, these structures are produced by a lot of different pulmonarius, uh, Pleurotus pulmonarius, is probably the more common one we'll see that can form these structures. And you can absolutely spot them on agar. Um, if you ever culture these fungi, you can give them low nutrient conditions and watch them form some of these structures in an attempt to supplement their diet. Um, but this particular toxosis strategy goes back a long ways in the evolutionary history of Pleurotus. These are especially cool. Um, when they were first found, uh, they're called stephanocysts. Um, we thought they were just an odd type of well-adapted cystidia. Um, we didn't know what their function was. We just kind of counted them as a unique structure formed by fungi. Turns out, uh, decades later, they're actually nematode traps. Well, more so meant to infect nematodes. They have this ring of spikes around the center and sort of through a combo of impalement. And then after impalement, they actually develop this adhesive pad on each of those spikes. You'll get nematodes completely covered in stephanocysts. And you can see that here in this bottom image where it's been completely coated in stephanocysts and uh, all of these little buds are hyphae starting out. These are primarily found in the corticiales, so hyphoderma is probably the most common mushroom that has these. Not every member of the genus does. It's actually used in their ID. Um, but it is, we've been finding more and more nematode hunting strategies in that group. Um, but these are just a great example of some of the insane anatomy that goes into attacking nematodes. Um, these are fun ones as well. Uh, when these were first found, they were described as spiky balls because it's pretty much what they are. Uh, these are actually on the mycelium of Caprinus comatus, the shaggy mane, a super common edible mushroom, grows in lawns everywhere. And we didn't know that it did this for, I mean, really almost a century, I guess, since we've been looking at it. Um, again, because it's only under low nutrient conditions that it will produce these. Uh, they more or less work by abrading the side of any nematode that touches it. So a nematode will contact one of these and either get so impaled it's stuck or it will simply tear itself open and fall prey to the mycelium. Um, so far as I know, they're not found on any of their Caprinus, but Caprinus comatus, this is another one where you could see it if you cultured it on agar. This is sort of a better derived version of that. Um, these are called acanthocytes. 
and they're formed on the mycelium of Strafaria rugoso annulata, commonly known as the garden giant or King Strafaria or wine cat. Um, and this, this is a mushroom that is not only an aggressive chip eater, compost eater, straw eater, like already an aggressive sap probe, it supplements its diet even further by producing these giant beds, these minefields almost laden with these acanthocytes and any nematode that comes across and contacts them gets unfortunately impaled and envenomated. Um, this was on the cover of Mycologia because it was such a phenomenal photo. Uh, here on the bottom, you can see detail on one of these acanthocytes. It actually has envenomated grooves. So it's not an active injection. It works more, more like a grooved barb where a nematode only has to contact a little bit of it in order to get poisoned. It will either fall apart on the spot or die where the mycelium can then find it and eat it. Um, these are another one that are super easy to observe on agar. And it's, it's amazing we miss these structures for so long. Um, these are arguably not a fungi. Uh, it's on an oomycete, so what they call water molds, but it was just too cool not to include. Um, we did consider them fungi for a long time, but they're a little too close to protists and protozoans to really stay. Um, these are actually called gun cells. Uh, if you look at the anatomy on these, it's literally a pressurized harpoon. It works in an extremely similar manner to the stinging cells on cnidarians, like jellyfish and hydra and anemones. So after one of these spores settles, it will produce an adhesive pad to glue itself to a surface on the ground. Um, it will form just a single gun cell, one gun cell per spore. Uh, it'll slowly develop its dart, which is this structure here, this coil behind it, and then pressurize the entire apparatus with this massive vacuole that just builds and builds and builds and builds in size until the whole thing is ready to blow. There's a muzzle right here with basically a designed very, very tense uh, mechanical failure point. When a nematode comes along and touches this, it snaps and all that pressure instantly gets released. It fires the dart out, uh, stabbing into the nematode. And then this cord will actually stay attached because the gun cell is adhered to the ground. It more or less gets tied down. And uh, after being darted, it inflates inside in order to infect the nematode. But this is just an absolutely phenomenally well, well developed and effective method. Um, it can be used not only on nematodes, but on uh, rotifers and tardigrades as well. But this is probably one of the most organized examples of one of these pred predatory structures. Uh, oh, and that was in haptoglossa. Sorry, haptoglossa are the oomycetes that produce these. Uh, so far as I know, they're the only ones. And then these are one of the most important traps to talk about in the realm of predatory fungi. These are adhesive traps. So if you look down here, you can actually see this sort of hourglass structure supported on the mycelium, coated in an almost invisible droplet. That droplet is an extremely potent adhesive. Once you contact it, it covalently bonds and you're more or less trapped. Um, the only way you'd get away at the point you touched one of these is if you actually broke the mycelium itself and carried it around with you. These traps are particularly brutal. Um, what you see here is actually a nematode that has gotten stuck to the traps and torn away from its own skin in an attempt to get out. So more or less separated from its skin, trying to pull away and it's, it's going to die and end up being eaten. Um, these sticky traps are produced by a very wide range of species. Um, it's probably one of the more effective ones involved in the evolution because it allowed them to not only hunt nematodes, these sticky traps work for rotifers, these small aquatic filter feeding micro animals. It works for tardigrades, 
Um, water bears, as they're more commonly known, another micro animal, they'll actually work for even softer bodied things like amoeba. Any moderately large microfauna is an, oppor an opportunity for one of these fungi to adapt and develop. And they've radiated out like crazy. There are sticky trap fungi um, more or less adapted for every group of, uh, of micro animal out there. This one in particular is actually a species I'll sort of be diving into called Nematoctinus. Um, this is just an example of amoebas being trapped by these sticky structures. And then over here, we actually have rotifers and the obligate specialized species designed to trap them. Um, this one up here is actually an amoeba, I believe, but just some cool examples of the diversity of the shapes and sticky traps out there. Now, going back to the history a little bit, um, after Zopf described the very first predatory fungus in the late 1800s, he had witnessed the snare forming Arthrobotrys preying on nematodes. He released his findings and it sort of created this wave of mycologists who were really interested in it. Um, one particularly tight group of researchers that basically collaborated back and forth were Dreschler, Thorne, and Barron. Now, Dreschler was an amazing mycologist. He started in about, I think his first papers were getting published in like 1913, 14, or 15. Um, and he published consistently for 50 years, basically up until his death. Um, he produced beautiful illustrations. This one on the back, uh, on the left, is by him. Just simple line work, but extremely informative. Um, at first, he was specializing in crop pests, things like oomycete water molds that were infecting plants. Um, but eventually, he just started looking into fungal ecology as a whole. In particular, one method that got him extremely far was water agar leaf litter cultures. So he would have a petri dish, a plate filled with water agar, which is a, a media formulation that is literally just gel and water. There's actually no nutrients added to it. Anything that's there is extremely trace. Then what he would do is he would go on these expeditions all around the world in his own country and bring back leaf litter and soil samples. He'd place a small bit in the center um, what was so remarkable about this simple and easy to replicate method, because there was no food being offered by the agar itself, it was an entirely enclosed ecosystem. The agar allowed chances for fungi and bacteria to spread out, but because there was no easy nutrients, the main, main ro roles in this ecosystem were either fungi, things that eat fungi, various micro animals. And this was the sort of stage that he set up um, it allowed him to describe hundreds and hundreds of predatory fungal species. Um, he has, I mean, really, I can't think of many mycologists that have more species named directly after them, even more than some of the older taxonomists out there, because he was so prolific and collaborated with so many other mycologists at the time. Um, as he was going through this, now, I think this was probably had to be the 20s or 30s at that point. Um, he had actually never seen anything but ascomycete and zygomycete fungi being predators. Nobody else had seen anything but these either. Um, for those, I guess, some background, there's really three main groups of fungi that we tend to talk about. It encompasses all the mushrooms we pick. Um, there's others, but really the three biggest groups are Ascomycetes, Basidiomycetes, and Zygomycetes. Basidiomycetes are pretty much all the gilled mushrooms, things with pores, things with teeth. They're large, they're fleshy. Um, pretty much if you think of a classic mushroom, chances are it's a Basidiomycete. Some of the uh, more well-known Ascomycetes are like morels, are probably the primary example. A lot of cup fungi, little tiny stick-like things, um, and a lot of asexual fungi are in Ascomycota. And the main reason they're divided is because they use different sexual cells to produce their spores. I won't go too far down that level of detail. Um, and then there are the zygomycetes, which are 
They pretty much don't produce any fruit bodies larger than a centimeter or so. They're all quite small, mostly asexual, um, but incredibly ecologically important. Now, they had found zygomycetes and ascomycetes at this point, plenty of them, super diverse, forming all uh, sticky traps, um, nets, nooses, snares, um, a wide range of different structures. And eventually, while Dreschler was undergoing his enclosure method, um, he actually found a species that was producing sticky traps and had clamps. Clamps are a structure on the hyphae only produced by basidiomycetes. And you can actually see them here, um, these little out of focus lumps at the septa between the cells are clamp connections. And now when you see this, it's basically indisputable proof that what you have is a basidiomycete. Um, this was super important because nobody else had found them at the time. Um, the particular sticky trap method that they used with these hourglass shaped cells uh, was unique. So he described them, he named them, and they're actually called nematoctonus, which more or less translates to nematode murder because they were so effective at it. Um, once he found one, he just went crazy. He described so many more. He basically filled the genus out. Um, other researchers started looking at these because they were so effective for use in croplands, agriculture, and human health. Um, they're so effective at trapping nematodes that in areas where parasitic nematodes are common, either human parasitic nematodes or plant parasitic nematodes, you can in deliberately inoculate with nematoctonus and have them prey on nematode larvae before they get a chance to infect anything. So a good example of that would be the, the strongyloides uh, fireworm nematode infection. It has an aquatic stage to its life cycle and you can actually inoculate waterways with a few different species of these predatory fungi and have them eat the larvae so efficiently it can disrupt the life cycle and keep them from spreading in an area. And of course the technology needed to mass produce mycelia and spores is quite simple, um, much more achievable than giant water treatment plants or pesticide campaigns. <clears throat> um, now, sort of in the context of all this, you know, Thorn, Barron, and Dreschler were all working, sometimes collaborating, sometimes separately to describe and characterize these species and their behavior, their use in agriculture, especially by Dreschler. Um, the mycologist Barron was actually sent a sample of nematoctonus taken from farmland soil. Um, it was likely a new species, one he hadn't seen before. So they sent it to him to be characterized. As he was culturing it, it actually fruited. This is especially important because despite the fact it had clamps, which are a sexual structure, nobody had associated nematoctonus with any sort of fruit body. They were presumed to be totally asexual. After this fruited on agar, he sent it off to a bunch of other mycologists, a bunch of other contemporary mycologists. They all bounced it around for a while and finally agreed that it was actually uh, Hohenwahalia, um, commonly known as like a flower pot oysterling. Um, it has kind of some like pretty bad common names. Uh, this is Hohenwahalia petaloides. Um, after it fruited, they finally were able to connect these two stages of a single organism's life cycle. So they actually found that when they cultured Hohenwahalia, like if you clone the tissue out of a Hohenwahalia or germinate its spores, the mycelium that results is a nematoctonus. Uh, likewise, they found that if they were actually able to coax nematoctonus into fruiting, you would get a Hohenwahalia. The problem is that for, at that point, like 50 years, mycologists had been separately researching nematoctonus and separately researching Hohenwahalia, giving them new names and categorizing them as their own individual fungi. Um, it sort of started off, now that one connection had been made, all of these mycologists were suddenly culturing every Hohenbohelia they could get their hands on. So far, every single Hohenbohelia that's ever been cultured has produced something that is characterized as a nematoctonus. Uh, 
um, DNA has been able to connect these species extremely well. Um, according to the uh, one fungus, one name convention in taxonomy, Nematoctinus is actually no longer valid. So even though that's the name that's been used to refer to the mycelia of these species, the predatory mycelia of these species, um, technically they're all Hohen Wahalia. So as we make the connections, we're slowly basically chopping away at nematoctinous names that exist. Now, not all of them have been tied to fruit bodies. Not all of them have been tied to a Hohen Wahalia species and they remain nematoctinous because they use such well-adapted strategies that it seems they may not ever need to fruit. Um, these are species that will produce not only sticky traps, but sticky spores. So they'll produce a load of asexual spores. They'll get contacted by a nematode, typically near the mouth as it's exploring. They'll germinate and run right down into the mouth of the nematode and eat it from the inside, produce a mycelia from it, and then immediately produce more spores. They will not have, you know, in contrast to the others, which have large mycelial networks dotted with traps at the margin, these have a very, very small mycelial network and a lot of traps and spores. Basically only enough mycelium where they can jump directly from nematode to nematode to nematode. Some of these, you won't even see hyphae projecting outside the nematode. You'll only see a few spores coming out of its uh, mouth and the other end um, to infect new nematodes that come to investigate these baited spores. Um, they'll spend the majority of their life cycle inside nematodes and seemingly don't have any requirement for fruiting. These are species that still carry the name nematoctinus because they may not ever fruit anymore. So while we know that it's technically deprecated, it still has to be held around for some of these. Um, sort of after we'd finally been making a lot of these connections, you know, eventually Hohen Wahalia petaloides this species right here, probably the largest and most commonly found Hohen Wahalia. Um, it was connected to a species of Nematoctinus, Nematoctinus geogenius. Um, that name doesn't actually exist anymore, but if you're looking at only the mycelium, that's exactly what it had been named. Um, while these connections were being made, there was a hubbub going on in the family Trichalomataceae. This was used as something of a waste basket taxon a lot of different white spored or what you'd say pleurotoid or oyster shaped mushrooms were getting thrown into this even though everybody knew it was uh, not monophilous so they knew that there was multiple taxa in here family level tax that had to be separated out but it was an enormous debate everybody was fighting about how to group up these these uh genera um thorn one of the same people who had been working with Baron and Dreschler um, actually argued that because uh, because Pleurotus and Hohen Wahalia both were the, at the time, they were the first and only Basidiomycetes known to hunt nematodes. Um, they argued that their shared ecological role tied them together. Um, Thorne put together an extremely, extremely interesting paper where he used phylogenetics he used morphology and he used behavior to tie two genera together. Now, behavior is not something that's usually used in taxonomical arguments. It's basically always morphology and genetics. So this was a really interesting paper to come across. And then to sort of tie it all together, they made this argument, their genetics stood up, their morphology stood up. And at the time being the only known predatory basidiomycetes, their behavioral arguments seem to stand up very well. They argued that at some point we might find a common ancestor. Years later, someone actually described a new species of a Hohen Wahalia, um, Hohen Wahalia canadensis, which when cultured produced both the oyster toxocysts and the Hohen Wahalia sticky traps at the same time on its mycelium. Um, it had both of these strategies going on at once. And when they did the phylogenetics on it, they found that it was actually basal to both groups. So it's in Hohen Wahalia. Hohen Wahalia is likely the older of the two and Pleurotus probably split off of something extremely similar to Canadensis 
Now, what I think is especially cool is that you have really two ecological roles diverging at the same time. You know, pleurotists still eat nematodes, but they sort of went off in a direction to largely prioritize wood decay. Um, they'll produce these toxicists given the chance, but they're relatively rudimentary, quick traps to make. Um, they'll often only produce it in a very nitrogen starved environment. So if the wood they're in isn't touching the ground, for example, and they can't access any soil nitrogen or leaf litter, um, say just a standing tree that's fallen over and gotten suspended, that's a scenario where they might produce these toxicists because they're really starving for protein. Whereas the other route, the Hohenwahalia route, um, they really focused on nematode eating. Hohenwahalia petaloides is probably an example more comparable to oysters where they do eat wood. They have strong rhizomorphs. They're very aggressive in eating wood chips, but they also produce an abundance of predatory traps for nematodes, those sticky traps. Um, but then you can follow all the other species of Hohenwahalia, all the diversity within that group and see the entire range. You know, you have at one end Hohenwahalia that never really even leave the bodies of nematodes, never fruit seemingly. Um, and then at one end, you have species that still do a little wood decay, like Hohenwahalia petaloides, and everything in between. The amount of traps produced, whether they also have trap spores, as well as trap mycelium. Um, it's really, you get to see the entire evolutionary range, sort of as you come up from this ancestral nematode hunting species into both. Now, they got moved into their own family, Pleurotaceae. And that family still stands today. The species concept they proposed contains these two and a, a smattering of other oddballs, most of which are actually asexual fungi that haven't been connected to a fruit body yet. And one thing called agaricochete that I can't find any documentation of since the 1800s, so I'm not even sure it exists. Um, but uh, it was really interesting sort of doing all the background on this and sort of stumbling across each of these papers separately by, by Baron, by Thorne, by Dreschler, learning more about these morphologies and then eventually realizing that all these papers are connected sort of all the way from Zopf up, seeing how the research eventually created one of the, the family that one of the most iconic cultivated mushrooms is in, Pleurotaceae. Um, I thought that was just absolutely interesting to see. We're still doing research on agricultural and biomedical research for these. Um, we're finding that maybe even with a little tweaking genetically, um, they might be our best option for dealing with nematodes because they're so good at evading things like uh, pesticides against them. They can end up in a variety of hosts and some of these nematodes cause massive crop failures. Something like Hohenbohalia is completely non-toxic, completely safe. And in the case of uh, Hohenbohalia petaloides, you can actually make a slurry from this. And if your garden is struggling from things like nematode root galls, um, you can apply this to basically extinct your soil of all nematodes because it is such an aggressive hunter. For a while now, I've really been arguing that the common name for Petaloides should probably be nematode eater. Um, it's a lot more interesting than flower pot oysterling, but it's my own soapbox. Um, the sad thing though, is we don't have as much money in mycology for purely exploratory research. What Dreschler was doing with his water agar and leaf litter scenario was largely exploratory. He didn't have guarantees. He would find new species. Um, until the agricultural uses became known, there was not much economic motivation for these. Um, so really a lot of this was sort of a time period where mycologists could use simple methods like this to get a lot done. Um, so almost driven by passion, you know, I didn't know these people, but really going through all of their manuscripts, you really get the idea that, you know, nobody publishes consistently for 50 years without quite a lot of passion involved, which is what Dreschler did. Um, and unfortunately that sort of research climate isn't exactly here anymore. Um, with exceptions of certain species that we've really focused in on, the exploratory work to find new species 
or to find species we already know of producing new and unknown types of traps uh, has basically stopped. We are not really looking anymore. Um, so, you know, the spiky balls on Caprinus comatus, uh, the function of the stephanocysts for hyphoderma, um, the acanthocytes on Strafaria rugoso annulata, these are structures described in form and function long after these species were known, even long after we'd cultivated and been eating them for years and years and years. The only reason it got found out is through exploratory work on water agar or similarly nutrient deficient agar, where these fungi suddenly, they show their ability for these remarkable predatory strategies to compensate for low nutrition from the agar itself. We basically have been missing out on an entire ecological role because we, we pamper them. <laughs> um, so I really, cannot advocate enough for people to pick up the super simple Dreschler method of water agar and leaf litter. Nematoctinus have been described all over the world, and it doesn't even begin to cover the range of ascomycetes and zygomycetes that consume uh, micro animals of all different kinds. Um, some of these species have even been found to prey on cladocerins, which are in the context of these animals, extremely large, uh, sort of shrimp, free swimming shrimp, maybe one millimeter long in some cases, which is enormous if you're talking about fungal traps or poisons. Um, but because we're not going through these methods, we're never really gonna know the range of species that's out there. It is quite likely that a ton of the common basidiomycetes we know and love form these structures, probably new structures that we've never even seen before. Uh, one of the first problems is that we've just never even seen the mycelium of most mushrooms. And then the second problem is we haven't even starved the ones we have cultured. Um, this is something you can absolutely do at home. If you have a basic agar setup, the leaf litter method is absolutely something you can do at home. If you have uh, agar setup and most microscopes uh, for home use with low and medium magnification objectives, can be used to watch this entire ecosystem play out day by day, hour by hour. You know, these are fast moving little micro terrariums. The, uh, the pegs from the Arthrobotrys nooses punch into the side of a nematode. They start growing within minutes of the nematode being trapped. It's rapid. Um, these are kind of tiny little microcosms that I think we need to open back up because we'll not only learn a lot more, but it's sort of an engaging little universe that I feel like we're missing out on at this point. Um, but really, I'm stunned by the history here, the simple, simple methods involved. This was, for the most part, bare bones microscopy and agar work. Um, I just really want to see it picked back up. Um, I think that about rounds out most of what I wanted to cover. Um, if any of you have questions, I would really love to hear them. Um, you know, sometimes this stuff can sort of go over people's heads. It's always hard for me to know exactly what stands out and what doesn't. Um, and then of course, which ones of you remembered the, the species for the trivia question? Yeah. Yeah, um, just real quick, um, do you happen to have a, a quick link you can drop in the chat for that method, um, the agar leaf, like the um, from some of the papers that- Yeah, was, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I know I know a lot of people are excited to maybe look at it, maybe attempt to do some of the experiments. Yes, um, I don't have it bookmarked on this computer, but I can absolutely pull that up. I think I should be able to link it pretty much right now. Let me pull it up. Yeah, and um, yeah, if anybody, if I missed any questions, uh, there's a lot of just like sharing links of specific species that you were speaking about in the chat. Um, let me check on YouTube real quick. Uh, let's see. Let's see, anybody, you know, people did have questions about, you know, utilizing this in an agriculture, kind of a garden setup. And of course you um, eventually, you got into like some of the 
specific species. I know the Stropharia species. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, those common. are important to cover, I think, because it sort of ties this to the larger mushrooms that we've been interacting with for a while. Species we actually know, whereas, you know, Arthrobotrys produces these just amazingly functional snares, um, but it's, it's what most people would consider a mold. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's not producing anything huge. Um, so let's see. Um, I think I'll probably get to questions and then dig through the papers to get those links. Just, I don't want to leave these. Um, so let's see. Uh, somebody asked if oyster mushrooms are not vegan because of this. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I would say they're still vegan, um, partially because every human on this earth eats nematodes basically at all times of day. You're, you're literally never gonna eat any plant from this earth without eating a lot of nematodes. You know, they're on your skin, they're inside your body at all times. They're, they're kind of everywhere. Um, oh God, what, I can't recall the name for this, the class of scientists that study nematodes. I don't think it's a nematologist, but uh, there's this quote from one where if you removed everything on earth, like if earth just vanished from existence and everything on it, and you only left the nematodes, you'd still be able to see everything by the thin white crawling film that was on every single surface of the planet. Um, wow. I love that imagery in particular. Yeah. Trying to do that as a Halloween costume. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a fun um, Very obscure reference. Right. My favorite kind of Halloween costumes. <laughs> Those are the good ones. I mean, it starts a conversation. Yeah. Um, I'm now realizing they might've been asking if it means oysters themselves as an organism were not vegan, you know, plant mm -hmm. eaters. Um, mm -hmm. No, most mushrooms aren't. They eat everything they get a hold of. Um, so let's see. Um, are rotifers nematodes and or are nematodes rotifers? So no, they're... They're both micro animals, so they're not protozoa. They're not single celled, they're multi celled. They're just very, very small. Nematodes are the long, generally clear worm like organisms. And uh, rotifers are kind of these, I don't know, pear shaped to disc shaped little filter feeders with a tail. They have this giant mouth that whips open to filter feed particles from everything. And they're also extremely common, except only where there's water. Uh, they revert to like a cyst form if it's dry, but pretty much all water on the surface of the earth is full of rotifers filter feeding. Um, oh yeah, and nematodes are also known as roundworms too. That would be another common name for them. Um, let's see. Oh, um, somebody asked if all of these predatory nematoctonists are petaloides. No. So there is essentially always going to be one species of nematoctonists that corresponds to one species of Hohenbohelia. So petaloides has geogenius, um, but each, each one has its own group going on. I think... Um, like one of the more common Hohenbohelia is that, well, not common, but really the only one I ever see in Oregon um, is a uh, Hohenbohelia mastrucata, really small, gray, jelly-like, and kind of warbled. And I believe its nematoctonus is called uh, N. fragilis, if I'm remembering that right. Um, but each, each nematoctonus only corresponds to one species of Hohenbohelia and vice versa. And technically, there's not even any nematoctonus anymore. It's just the name we've used for their mycelium. Um, people talking about being excited to attempt the leaf water agar. Um, I will definitely include that link. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, it looks like we did actually get somebody in the comments to answer it. Uh, answer the trivia question correctly. I don't know if somebody on YouTube beat them to it further. Did anybody answer it on YouTube that you saw? Uh, no. I mean, let me just double check. We can look at the timestamp. No, 
All right. Well, going through the chat, so far as I can tell, um, the answer to the trivia question, which was which species of Hohenbohelia is the basal ancestor uh, at the base of Hohenbohelia and Pleurotus, and that was the one that had both sticky sticky traps and toxin traps, the Hohenbohelia canadensis. Um, it looks like Drea Mastro, Drea. Mastro Matt, Drea wow. at 554 nailed it. Nice, Drea. So she's going to win this tarot set. That's exciting. Good job, Drea. Wee! <laughs> huh. Paying attention. I mentioned, you know, throw, it's hard when you're throwing out so many names, but I wasn't sure if that trivia question would be too hard or not. I'm glad somebody got it. So I have a question and this, uh, this kind of is going off on a tangent a little bit with your, um, and I can't remember the category, but it was like not a fungus, right? Uh, so we had a talk back in August with um, a Michael, or a, he's a um, expert in ants. And in, in Texas, we have this invasive ant called the Tawny Crazy Ant. And um, this, uh, the Brackenridge Field Lab, they, they discovered um, a fungi or a, um, and I'm going to drop the name because I'm very bad at Latin in the chat. Um, but it's, as he was explaining it, he was explaining the mechanism and it seemed very similar to what you were describing the mechanism really? of that other. Yeah. And um, he was saying that, you know. Hands. And so this fungi was found in the stomachs of the, of the crazy ants. And um, I think they found it in Florida and then they were able to cultivate it and grow it in a lab and completely eradicate um, this um, invasive ant that takes out fire ants even. Like, oh, um, are you talking about microsporidians? Yeah, microsporidians, yeah. yes. Yeah, those are kind of even crazier. Um, they don't use those gun cells, but they're actually, they'll be inside the cells of their host. So they're, mm -hmm. they're tiny, you know, micro sporidian, it's in their name. They're small enough. Mm -hmm. They can be inside host cells. Um, I've never really heard of them. Being they don't have mitochondria cells. too, is what he was describing. They're, they're almost like a, they almost behave kind of like a virus really. Yeah. Like they're yeah. very, very simplified, tiny things impossible to eradicate from what I understand, but I've never heard of them being used like that. That's super interesting. But apparently like they're in the soil and, you know, so it, it, it was just really kind of a, I don't know, like, and I was so thank, I was so glad that they were able to find this and then use it as a bio kind of pesticide in a way, because mm -hmm. we're just not looking for stuff like this. Like most scientists no. don't, aren't, like looking for stuff like this, which is everywhere. Like a lot of this stuff is everywhere and it does like create like this sort of stasis or like even things out in a lot of ecosystems. And uh, when we have, you know, all this human disruption going on and apparently like this particular ant or like it comes in on a lot of people's RVs cause they just like the, the shapes and everything that the RVs have. And it's like nice little places for them to hide and it's just a mode of transportation that, you know, gets them to another location. So a lot of the state parks in Texas are starting to have these invasions of this ant that takes out all the colonies, like even fire ants, which people don't like and already like, yeah, like they're the same size as fire ants. So they just like come in and they have like this acid all over their bodies that kills any, kills all the ants. And then they just take over their houses. It's really oh wild. God. Yeah, there was a lot of really good press about it. Our Texas Monthly did a really good article. I can send it to you. I would um, love that. Yeah, but um, um, but the, as you was, as you were describing it, I'm like this like mechanism was seeming very similar. Um, but yeah, I'm just kind of curious too, like how using microscopy like how do you how do scientists like how are they able to observe that it's just like really high level micro or what, what what kind of setup is needed to so see generally when you're talking about this sort of system you're looking at um you're looking at on a petri dish right mm -hmm. um you would have your culture of fungi and co-culture it with 
uh, your prey organisms. So like nematodes mm -hmm. would be the common one. Um, the ideal microscope for this sort of thing is an inverted microscope. Mm -hmm. um, those are typically a lot more expensive, but it's pretty much just an upside down standard, uh, like, um, like objective set. So, you know, on a, on a standard microscope, your objectives are up here, rotating above your specimen, above the mm -hmm. stage with your light source coming from below. Um, an inverted scope is the opposite where your objectives are below the specimen. Mm -hmm. um, really the only reason that's advantageous is because the top of the stage is open. So you mm -hmm. can handle large things like Petri dishes a lot easier, potentially mm -hmm. small tubs or culture vessels, micro well plates. Um, but those are generally gonna be outside the range of most people. What I'd actually suggest is sort of a pairing of methods, um, depending on how your plate is set up. Ideally, you want to be able to actually flip it upside down, have a thin mm -hmm. layer of agar, and typically the focal distance for uh, what people call like low and medium objectives, just on any standard like teaching scope or home scope, um, you can actually zoom through the agar and see the surface. And that surface is where nematodes are gonna be interacting with the hyphae. You'll be able to see mycelium in their structures. Um, there can be problems like if you have loose leaf litter that it might fall when you flip a plate, you might have to pin it down or do some sort of design changes in your experiment to make that work. Um, but nematodes are, you know, on the larger side of organisms, they're pretty easy to see with low and medium magnification. So what you can sort of do is look for one destructive interaction of nematodes with your fungus. So that's how a lot of these screenings go is mm -hmm. you'll, you may separately culture fungi um, or you may always start with the co-culture which is like the really dirty cultures that Dreschler would do. He would just put leaf litter onto a water agar plate and watch what happened um, because mm -hmm. you naturally come with the fungus and its prey in one go. A common assay is to grow things out of something like leaf litter, add nematodes, and then you basically see if the nematodes start dying, whether they're getting poisoned, whether they're getting stuck down to something or stabbed to death. Um, mm -hmm. Once you confirm that there's some sort of destructive action against nematodes, um, if you had an inverted scope, you could probably go higher than like a medium mag just right there. But mm -hmm. once you've confirmed there's destruction, what you can actually do is excise portions of the agar put it on a slide, and then you're able to get those higher magnifications that'll allow you to see what form of fungal structures involved. So that's where you'd be able to really see all the cells in a noose or the shape and function of the acanthocytes or the spiky balls, et cetera. Um, so sort of, you can kind of survey what the nematodes are doing. Um, and then if you notice something going on, that's when you would separate them, get a closer look on, uh, slide so you can go to higher magnifications mm -hmm. and actually learn more about the structures themselves. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so Connor was asking about trichoderma, which is an endophyte, which is a kind of a different, whole different category. I don't know if you had any, anything, anything exciting, predatory well, to say about that, I mean, predatory on your growing. <laughs> one of the, um, it gets really dicey. This is where like area gets super gray. Um, in the case of trichoderma, it's what has often been called a mycoparasite. Um, this is because it, it consumes other fungi aggressively. It kills and consumes other fungi. It mm -hmm. has a lot of special adaptations for this. Um, the problem, even though these things can't move, it's a very active fight. You know, trichoderma and the fungus it's attacking have a lot of well-developed mechanisms to try and go back and forth, um, prevent itself from being eaten, and also make sure it eats. Um, these are complex interactions, but because neither party is capable of moving at any real speed, we've sort of just thrown the parasitic label on it. Um, in my opinion, if both parties are literally incapable of moving, we should probably look a little closer at how we draw our definitions on things like predatory. But, you know, trichoderma will do this thing called uh, coiling where you'll have like a hypha, like a hyphal cell of a host and the trichoderma will coil around it. 
Um, mm. It'll actually wrap around. And then once it's wrapped around, it'll basically secrete enzymes until it just eats its way through and takes over the whole connected hyphal branch more or less. Um, and that doesn't even cover just the chemical barrages it unleashes that kills mycelium from a distance as well before sopping it up. Um, but trichoderma is a very complex group. You know, they're endophytic with plants. And then if they get mad, they can become parasitic. Um, they can just do their own thing in the dirt. No problem. They eat bacteria. They just, they're all over the place. Trichoderma. They're really interesting. Mushroom farmers tend not to like it because it kills your mushrooms, mm -hmm. but it's a fun group. Yeah. Yeah. And we always encourage people, you know, especially, you know, we have a lot of people interested in a lot of different farming, mushroom farming and growing plants. But yeah, if you do ever have contamination, it's beneficial for your soil and your plants. So just make sure you put it back in the soil where it belongs. Mm -hmm. um, it's yeah. Not a whole lot. It's not a hundred percent loss. <laughs> it will help your plants for sure. And um, yeah. Any other questions out there? And um, yeah, this has been really great. Um, Somebody had asked if we could find some of the references. Um, I have them all saved in a massive email that I sent to myself. Um, it's kind of a massive info dump, but it covers, it's basically all the literature related to everything I just talked about. Okay. I can potentially forward that to you. Yeah, you can send it to me and I'll just drop it on the event page. Yeah, um, and it, it's a it's a massive dump. It's probably like forty papers, but it contains basically everything I went over and more. You know, there, okay, there's so much. Perfect. I'll just put like a subject. reference list yeah. um, below your bio on the bottom of the page, so people can always go back to this event page, event link, and grab it if they have questions. I um, will go ahead and just send that to you right now they're not particularly well organized but their titles do sort of hint as to what they're about um okay. but it's a great um a great info dump on this subject for sure and it does cover all the things like the water agar method in some of these um really detailed uh accounts of exactly um how these things work it goes into like the toxins that are used in the toxocysts really all of it is there. Um, you could read that and be quite close to where I am on my history of knowing these things. Yay. Right. Well, great. Thanks everybody for myceliating with us tonight. And thank you, Sydney, for taking of the course. time away from the the fiber fa fa symposium. Oh, I mean, I wouldn't miss it. I'm glad to be here. Yay. And uh, we hope to see everybody that's in the central Texas area at some of our events coming up. We have a couple weeks of stacked events. So we hope to see you in person. And yes, we really appreciate everybody coming out tonight and everybody have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>